Hey, it's Mike here, and today, salt. After years of requests, I'm finally doing it, and so we're gonna ask, how bad is salt really when we zoom out and take a level-headed look at the research? We're also gonna ask some questions like, do we require salt or is salt addictive? It is a white powder after all. And finally, how about those fancy obscure types of salt? Are they healthier for you? All right, let's do this. Let's do this. Ladutis. All right, let's cover some basics. For culinary purposes, we're talking about sodium chloride when we say salt, though in chemistry there are plenty of types of salt. And in terms of sodium, salt itself is about 40% sodium. So they're not exactly interchangeable. And you probably already knew that. And what are the going recommendations for salt? Well, directly from the FDA, well, they recommend eating no more than 2,300 milligrams per day. The average person in the US is eating 3,400, oops. Just blew right past that one. But why do we actually need to keep salt consumption down? Well, we have a ton of evidence showing that as salt intake increases, so does high blood pressure, and that can exacerbate heart disease. How does that work? Well, to start, when you have a ton of salt in your body, your kidney can't properly perform osmosis and get rid of all the liquid that it needs to. This increased amount of liquid in your same old circulatory system increases pressure, creates tension, hypertension, and that's the official name for high blood pressure. And looking to the intersalt study, they mapped out how much sodium was peed out because it's more accurate than just asking people how much they ate and their blood pressure rates. And the result was the more sodium peed out, the higher the blood pressure. Intimate connection. Probably shouldn't say pee and intimate in the same sentence. With all the salt that we eat in the US, it's no wonder that nearly one third of the population has hypertension. And in terms of people over 40, you might as well just flip a coin because 50% of people over 40 have hypertension. And in terms of heart disease, simply put, if you have something going wrong in your arteries, the last thing you want is more pressure pushing on that wrong thing. Such science. If you have a lesion in your artery, it's sort of analogous to pushing on your cut, putting pressure on it, or running it under a faucet. Anything that puts more stress on the system is gonna be bad for it. Especially when you consider that the vast majority of heart attacks are when a cap bursts on a lesion and it sort of opens like a flap and blocks things and kills you, gross and horrible. The last thing you want is stuff pushing harder, going by and then slam, like, no, you don't want that. Hey, I'm your artery. Don't eat those salty french fries. Why you put them in your mouth? No, don't do that. Oh, it's over for me. It's over. What did you just watch? I don't know. And another note worth mentioning from William C. Roberts, a master at the American College of Cardiology, atherosclerosis is caused by a cholesterol problem and hypertension, high blood pressure, is really just a risk factor in the equation, not the original cause. With that said, still, just that risk factor of high blood pressure is so lethal that by lowering our salt intake by 15%, we could prevent eight and a half million deaths over the next 10 years, according to this study. And by eliminating some of the saltiest foods and stopping the adding of our own salt, we could save 100,000 lives in the US each year. But perhaps one of the biggest hurdles in this battle is that when we think of salt, we think of this. We think of a salt shaker, but in reality, 75% of our sodium comes from processed foods. And looking to this study that looked at sodium intake in the US, yeah, you may have heard that bread is up there and it's at 9% of total sodium, but if you total up all of the animal products, you're in around about 30% of our total sodium. And we're talking super salty cheeses and injecting salt directly into meat. That's to increase the weight and make it last longer and fight pathogens and taste, etc. In fact, the main source of sodium in people aged 20 to 50 was actually chicken, which is pretty shocking. So it's no wonder that depending on the study, vegans have about 65% lower high blood pressure rates, which is pretty shocking as well. And yes, from this study, vegans do have very considerably lower intakes of sodium. But that might not explain it all. From this study, there are other potential reasons that vegans might be lower, and they include improved artery dilation, increased antioxidant content and anti-inflammatory effects, improved insulin sensitivity, decreased blood viscosity or thickness, altered baroreceptors or pressure receptors, and other cool things like modifications of the gut biome. So if you're looking at vegan arteries which have less atherosclerosis as studies like this one measured, 
It's an artery that can not just detect the increased pressure, but then respond to it by dilating and creating more volume, which means less pressure. And so the benefits of having healthy arteries are twofold. One, you can prevent the high blood pressure in the first place by reacting to it. And two, you might not have lesions for the high blood pressure to react with anyway. However, based on information like this, I've heard many vegans say, oh, well, you don't really have to worry about sodium at all on a vegan diet. You can just eat as much sodium as you want. Well, I would agree that vegans appear to have an extra a buffer against high sodium, it's never a good idea to overdo it. And there are other things in addition to heart disease, like stomach cancer, for example, that are linked to sodium. From this study, dietary factors, including salt consumption, are considered relevant in the causation of stomach cancer. Causation. In particular, salt can work together with H. pylori in stomach infections and increased mutations and cancer cell growth neither things you want. Another sort of myth I've heard people perpetuate is that since Asian countries have really high sodium content and they're pretty healthy, that eating high salt is totally okay. Well, for example, Koreans consume significantly over 4,000 milligrams of salt per day. Men are up around 6,000 with the upper quartile or quarter of men nearing 10,000 milligrams of sodium per day, which is insane. Well, Koreans also have the highest rate of stomach cancer in the world. And as you can see by this chart, other Asian countries are paying for the salt consumption as well. Yes, I know I'm talking about association, but we do have that causality to back it up. Back to these researchers who conclude that we could see a substantial reduction in stomach cancer by lowering our salt intake. Moving on, there's also an interesting sodium calcium bone connection as well, which I'll cover briefly. Science Daily interviewed Todd Alexander, a researcher on the topic, and he said, quote, when the body tries to get rid of sodium via the urine, our findings suggest that the body also gets gets rid of calcium at the same time. He goes on to say that we have a molecule in our body that's responsible for moving both sodium and calcium, and also that, quote, this is significant because you're eating more and more sodium in our diets, which means our bodies are getting rid of more and more calcium. So not only could high sodium consumption lead to osteoporosis, for example, but if you have a higher salt intake, then you will require more calcium. All right, now for a fun question. Do we require salt? I've heard many people say this. Does that mean it's true? Well, going back to the intersalt study, we had the Yanomami Indians of Brazil who were studied as a no salt culture. They did not add salt to their food. They were in around about 200 milligrams gram per day, so one-tenth of our upper daily limit. Zero of the Yanomami in that study had high blood pressure, and they did not appear to have other adverse effects as well. It makes sense that we don't require salt because it has only been used widely in food for about 5,000 years, so that means that every human that lived before 5,000 years ago was just dead. So no, we do not need to add salt to our food and sodium is naturally occurring in our food, thankfully. All right, now for obscure salts. I'm talking your pink Himalayan crystal salt, your Celtic sea salt, your fleur de sel from France and your black Hawaiian salt, stuff like that. Personally, I only use purple desert salt, which must be captured from the dripping perspiration off a camel's testicle into a crystal vial. It doesn't raise my blood pressure. I'm sorry, sodium is sodium. And if it's about minerals from you, you don't have to eat sodium with minerals. You can get them from food or other sources that aren't high sodium. And some of you are probably thinking, what about iodine though? I talked about iodine and salt a bit in my hypothyroidism video, and it is clear that in general, adding iodine to salt or iodizing salt helps, but it can also be overdone, and that's because excess iodine can create issues. But it's clear that iodine and the proper amount can be super effective in preventing goiters. From this study published in the journal Nutrients, David Marine, a US physician from Ohio, and his colleagues did an iodine prophylaxis program in over 2,100 schoolgirls in 1917, a prevention program, and from the patient papers they published, children treated with iodine had 0.2 incidence of goiters, and the children who did not receive the iodine had 25% or greater incidence of goiter. That's 125 times less goiter action. Way to goiter done, David. So unless the only way that you're gonna be able to get iodine consistently is that you have it in salt, you just don't need to get sodium with your iodine. There are other sources, but when you're looking at things like seaweed, you have to make sure that they have iodine on the container because they can have an inconsistent level. 
But the most annoying part here is that in certain soils, just a couple potatoes could get you a good chunk of your daily value of iodine, but because soils are so inconsistent, they could also have basically no iodine. So that sucks. Okay, all this information is great, Mike, but what about practically changing sodium habits in real life? You know, maybe you wanna eat less sodium, and the first thing I wanna mention is the addictive nature of sodium and why you need to be aware of that. From this study, it appears that it also has some of the same dopamine pathways as drugs. That is, it's sort of hacking your reward system because we wouldn't have access to sodium in the amount that we do. It was more scarce in nature. With that in mind, I think the best place to start is seeing how much sodium you actually eat in a day. And you can use things like chronometer.com to do it, or you can just write it down on a piece of paper and add it up later. For packaged foods you eat, you can simply turn around, look at the nutrition facts and tally up the sodium on there. For salt you're adding yourself, you could serve it with a teaspoon because we know a teaspoon is about 2,300. Quarter of a teaspoon would be about 500. And what about restaurants? Well, the Center for Science in the Public Interest took a look at the sodium content of a bunch of restaurant foods. And so if we average those, we can take a best guess of a menu item having about 1,200 milligrams of salt in it. And of course, as you can see by this chart, the sodium amount varies depending on the restaurant. Once you've totaled up all the sodium that you eat in a day, though you probably already lowered it because you were counting, then you can figure out what foods are really high and then eliminate them. And the answer as always is whole plant foods. They have no added sodium. And speaking of whole foods, in case you didn't know about it, I do have a whole food vegan cookbook that I made. I knew he had an evil agenda, whole foods. So in summary, we eat too much salt. It kills a lot of people. We should probably eat less. In terms of vegans, they magically have some resistance to it, those 65% lower rates. So while I don't consider it another vegan killer, I definitely don't consider it a health food and people should still eat less of it because of other things like stomach cancer risk. As a student of public health, that's my take anyway. And finally, remember that it does have addictive properties. So maybe join a 12 step salt program. Those don't exist, start one. Finally, I just wanna put out a major thanks to everybody that got me something off my Amazon wish list. That's E. Marcus, Alexander O, Matthew R, and Reed S. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. All right, that's it for today. Feel free to like, you know what? If you learned a single fact, then definitely feel free to like, hit that like button and subscribe, why not? All right, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.